Welcome back to JDM Legends, presented by Turn 14 Distribution, where today we rip into this thing. If your eyeballs are amazed by how shiny and good this car is looking, well, that means you missed the last episode and you should go back and watch that because this car is looking really good. Actually, the last two episodes where we cut and polished it, did the suspension on it with Fortune Auto coilovers and tried out a bunch of different wheels and tires on it, put on this front lip from Shine Auto and it's looking so much better. It's kind of staggering what a difference those simple uh, upgrades have made. But today is all about getting this car ready to go back to the stock twin turbo setup. So as we discussed before, we want to put this thing back to like an OE, OEM plus type of configuration rather than this single uh, big single conversion. So we're going to strip everything out of here, starting by taking the front end off because we want to get a good look at how the intercooler uh, piping is all done and we're replacing the rad. We're changing out the timing belt, changing out some seals. So uh, I think it's time to get to work here and start tearing into this thing. I love it when a job goes as easy as that. Something special about 90s Japanese cars and the way they were put together, they just all come apart so easily as you guys just saw. Bumper came off easy, headlights came out even easier, and now we can see what we're dealing with. I'm pretty confident this is a no-name front mount intercooler, which is all fine and dandy. I mean, we're gonna leave this. It's, it works, like it, I'm sure it, it holds pressure and it's gonna do the job of like adequately cooling for the power that we're gonna be making. What I don't love, however, is uh, the setup here. Oh, look at this hose here. It's kind of crazy. It reminds me of the fuel hose we used on the gas tank in Connie Celica. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm trying. I want to yank it's it out here so corrugated. you can just kind of like look at it and figure out what in the heck it is. Oh, there it goes. All right. Well, this says Green Line. Hose and fitting, hard wall marine coolant and something type certified. So I, 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 you know what, like this would work for this type of setup. I don't know if it's efficiently gonna flow air through it, but it's designed to make that bend. And I, you know, for the, the previous owner, I'm sure he was just trying to get this thing done and didn't wanna build a bunch of custom piping here. And that certainly would have worked. We are however gonna ditch this the other thing I can note, it does not look like uh, this turbo is used. I think this was a brand new turbo that was installed because there is like no shaft play. It is mint. Look at it, it spins up. It does like look a, brand new. Like yeah, yeah. No it looks like there's no dirt or anything, or anything here. There, yeah. So it's not like it's a previously used turbo. So that is a good thing. That I'm sure will fetch a couple dollars on the interwebs. Oh, quick question for you guys. You can see the coolant reservoir has been relocated down to here. Usually it lives up uh, above the area up here, but now because the front mount is here, they've relocated it down here. And I don't know if that is proper in the sense of it's way lower than the actual radiator is. Mm -hmm. um, I still think it's a vacuum, so it should work properly. But anyways, post in comments, let me know. Or if you guys have solutions as to where to put this to be in a better spot, certainly let me know as well. I think it's time for another game of uh, oil roulette. What do you guys think? Is it gonna be a uh, black coffee in there? Is it gonna be a nice uh, amber cup of tea? Is it gonna be fresh? Is it gonna be old? I'm going with black coffee. I mean, let's be honest. I'm going with fresh. Are I you? Think he, for sure, because they just put the turbo kit on. It hasn't been finished, so. Oh, man. I, see, I, I think, think they it's gonna be done pretty, the pretty fresh. If the turbo was ready to run, but let's see. Oh, PT wins. Oh, Look at that thing. That's a weird color. It's kind of muddy. Oh, yeah. It's a little murky. Stick your finger in there. Let's see what it looks like. Muddy, PT. That's not, it's a weird color. It's, it's like, is there coolant in there? Is there fuel in there? It could be fuel, man, because so, smell it. Why is that so brown? Smell oh it. Oh my God, the fuel. That's it, because this thing's just been running like super, Ooh. super rich. That smells like 50% fuel. That is insane. Look at the weird color. It's like this weird, muddy, brown color. Well, it's a good thing we're draining it. And it's super thin, like when you, oh man, take a whiff of that PT. That is a strong fuel smell. Oh yeah. 
Well, after seeing just how much fuel there was in the oil in this engine, we're now a little bit concerned about the health of the engine. So we've decided we want to do a compression check. But before we do that, we actually want to put some fresh oil in it, help kind of clean all that fuel out of it and just, you know, lubricate the, uh, the piston rings for a compression uh, check. And to do that, we've decided to uh, show off a new product from Valvoline. This is actually the world's first engine oil designed for engines with over 150,000 miles. No one else has ever done this before. I think it's pretty cool. And I'm actually running it in my Tundra now, which is over 150,000 miles. This engine's not, but we figured it's a good opportunity to talk to you a bit about it. And really the, the specialness about this is its detergent package, which is designed to not only clean the engine, but help prevent oil consumption, which is obviously often a problem with high mileage motors. For more information on this, click on the link in the description below and give us a follow on Instagram too, because we're actually going to be giving away some of this along with some Valvoline merch. So uh, if you follow us and follow Valvoline on Instagram and you see a photo of this come up with some merch, you'll know that that is the giveaway. So get in there, read what the uh, instructions are and you may win some of this. Well, what an interesting find. Check it out. I just pulled the valve cover, the plastic piece off and wow, we have ourselves a blue timing belt. I don't know the brand yet, it doesn't show. And uh, some blocks cam gears. So that certainly means that this timing belt has been done, I think pretty recently. What isn't good though is, I just noticed I'm trying to pull the coil packs off and so many of these plugs, you can see the connectors are all uh, destroyed and like there's, there's supposed to be a, a white plastic, I don't know if insert, you, insert them, there, yeah. you can see this one and this one's also broken up too. So essentially all these plugs are just destroyed. Like look at this one just came off. Oh my oh goodness. My God, that's not good. So which you know could be if these weren't connected properly could be why this thing is so flooded with fuel and oh, it's oil because yeah. it was probably firing on like four of six cylinders maybe too. So yep. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not good in here. I'm gonna keep continue to yank this thing out and then we can do a compression test. My suspicion that this thing wasn't firing on all cylinders may have just been proved because this is number two cylinder spark plug and look, number one. <laughs> brand new. It is brand new. I don't think there was any ignition going on. You can smell the gas on it, but there was nothing happening. So I'm gonna keep going here. Right now we are uh, one for three with clean spark plugs. We're just pulling the last one and yeah, it looks like all of them but one were firing. So uh, let's just get the compression tester out here. We've got the OTC compression tester hooked up. So let me hit it. This is a cold test. So unlike the last one, we're expecting numbers around 150 ish as per the factory service manual. And I'm going to crank it eight times just to be consistent. Okay. Yeah, that's a nice healthy number. That's a good sign. We saw a nice consistent compression across all six cylinders between like 170 and 180. All in all, nice com consistent numbers, actually a little higher than expected from the factory cold test numbers, but consistency is what matters Yeah, most. and we have those H2, uh, HKS264 cams in it, so that may help That may bump, affect it. Yeah, that's true, good point. So, I don't know. Uh, clean bill of health, I think, everyone. So that means we can move on to draining the coolant and getting uh, this stuff out of the front end. Radiator and shroud is out. I wanted to ask you guys, what is this tiny little fan for here? Is this like an auxiliary fan for the oil or the, the transmission cooler or what? Because I truthfully have never seen something like this. Super neat, super cool. It's just a tiny little fan. If you own a Supra or a 2JZ engine, then you will know the crank pulley bolt is a nightmare to get loose. It's super tight. I think the factory is like over 200 foot pounds of torque. So we think this one has been off, obviously, because this is needed to be serviced and, and changed. So we're hoping it's gonna come off pretty easily. However, this being an automatic, usually what we would do is with a manual, 
you take one of the, uh, the covers off and you just stick a, a pry bar in there, hold the flywheel, and then crack this bad boy loose. With an automatic, you can't do that. So that's kind of like left me scratching my head as to what to do. And of course, a quick search on the internet has netted a, a technique that I am a very, very uh, worried about actually and, and skeptical. And what that is, is you take a, you can see here, you take a breaker bar and a socket. This is actually like a, an actual crank pulley socket. You can see it's weighted. And then you put it on and you pop the starter. You just give it a quick hit and apparently that's supposed to crack this loose. That seems super sketchy and could result in breaking the, the bar. But you know what? We figured why not give it a try and show you guys how this goes. All right, here we go. Oh, hold on. Oh, that's not good. That was weird. Oh, maybe it's loose. Maybe it's loose then. I think that, that must have done it because otherwise it wouldn't spill. Yes! As you guys just saw, we actually had uh, mounted the camera on a tripod in fears of something bad happening, but it did not. And we now have ourselves a crank pulley that is loose. I'm not gonna recommend this one. I think there's still a, a bit of a safety hazard when you're doing that. So uh, certainly do that at your own risk. Next step here is to remove the crank pulley. And as you can see, it does not slide off. I've got this uh, cheap power built steering wheel puller kit that works perfectly in this case. As you can see, the two bolts just screw into the pulley. And then all I do here is turn this. And you can see that since this has been off, you can see it just comes off very, very lightly. But uh, in some cases, this also is jammed up on here and requires more force. So, but you can see this is working exceptionally well. So with this major hurdle over uh, out of the way, we can now remove all the timing belt covers. It seems to be all good in here. Uh, I did time the engine right now to top dead center and the mark does line up here and our blocks cams look like they are perfectly in time here, which is a really good thing. The tensioner has been replaced. The pulley has been replaced. The water pump also looks like it has been re replaced, although it's been painted black. There's a, you can see there's a little bit of like overspray on the belt here too, where somebody was like trying to make sure everything was black in here, I suppose, to, you know, give it that, the engine that murdered out look. So quick inspection here. You can see these cams are certainly new, but judging by the color and the nice thing is it does not look like it's totally black in here, which is also a good thing. So that means this motor has had somewhat regular intervals for oil changes. Um, now getting back to the cams, these are in fact HKS 264 cams. I can tell by the marking up front here that says T083 and the other one is T084. And when you look it up on the internet, on HKS's website, you can see that that in fact is to the 264 cams. Now. Our original plan was to actually remove these and put the stock cams out of the other car in, but I did a bit of reading and some guys are claiming that, you know, running these with the stock ECU, it works, it's gonna be fine, and it'll actually pick up a bit of power. So I'm thinking we're just gonna leave them. Like everything here, it looks like it was done properly, it's time. So I just don't think it's, it's worthwhile swapping this stuff out because, you know, in the, the, the event of this picking up some power, that's not a bad thing. Getting to this part was easy, PT. <laughs> it's just every aftermarket manifold, whether it's this one or any other one, like certainly there are ones that are designed to be much easier for the, uh, the nut installation onto the stud. I know full race is pretty good. Um, but for example, this one, which I, I, I don't know the brand, but like, I, I'm struggling to get the last two underneath here off. And as you can see, like, I gotta wiggle this, turn it just a little bit. Like, luckily I can use my finger at this point and kind of like try to get it off here. 
Same thing with this middle one here, and then it just like jams up a bit. You just gotta like go back and forth on it a hundred times to get this off because you'll, as I'll show you in a second, like the way these runners go down, you have to put the nuts on and then like slowly turn them on or, or, or tighten them as you move the manifold on. And because of that, it just creates this absolutely garbage work environment where it's just like you curse and you swear for two hours or whatever it is to, to try to like take this stuff on and, and, and or put it on and off. Like, let me show you some of the nuts that were used on here too. Like there's 10 different nuts that were used. And again, I'm not blaming the previous owner. It's just, there, it's, there's so little room, right? Like, look at this thing. It's been mangled 10 times. Like, you know, if, and that's the only way, like you need to use a nut of this size because it can't, there's no other way to like get it on there. Now I've got one last one in here. Oh, I should say two actually. Oh, there it goes, okay. You know, same thing, one like that. And now let's take this off. Ugh. And you can see what I was talking about. Like look at how tight the runners are right here. Like with the stud pulling through, like you just, you could not get at them. I could see they had to actually cut this guy down a bit here. The stud. Yeah, the stud. Just the front of it. So I feel it like we had to like, do that once too, didn't we? I, I, yeah, we did too. Like, it's it's just the nature of the beast. And this, unfortunately, is not the right gasket. You definitely do not want to use these. You want to use the the Toyota metal ones, because if you're not using those, these blow out. And as you can see, if you've got to do this job again, it's just a, a, a bit of a struggle. And you know, for you, you guys, why don't you guys post in the comments if you've ever seen. This manifold, like I certainly don't love the design of some of these runners. Like look at these runners just going straight into the, what is I assume supposed to be the collector. It's just, it's not very smooth. Like the welding in here does not look good. I'm sure it's some cheap kit and that's why it fits like garbage. When I originally looked at this turbo kit on the car, I thought, my goodness, this thing is so huge. It's gonna spool so late around 6,000 RPM. It's gonna be a lag monster. But we just did uh, check the product number on it. And this turns out to be a uh, Borg Warner S364 turbo, which essentially has a 64 millimeter inducer wheel. And on the, uh, on the turbine side, I think it was 80, 73. 73, 73. Yeah. So it's actually not that big. Um, these turbos do come on around 4,500, 5,000 RPM, depending on your setup. So um, for a Supra, that's not terrible. I think for a streetcar, it's gonna be laggy. Like the, all the information I kept reading on, online was that, you know, these turbos are a bit lazy per se, but that doesn't mean that this, this turbo is not gonna work well for somebody else. Like if you're looking to go drag racing, this seems like a, a pretty cool setup. Last job of the day, why not clean the engine bay? Cause we've got such great access to everything and we can see how dirty it is down there. It's actually in good shape. There's basically no rust down there, although they did paint a lot of stuff, so it's hard, hard to know for sure what lurks underneath, but let's give it a good cleanup and at least make it shine a little bit because we know you guys like shiny engine bays. Every time we leave an engine bay dirty like this, you get on our case. And oh, by the way, I did give it the full first night in prison treatment by plugging every hole. triggering sound of water going down the drain, like Pete's hopes and dreams of working on his skyline before we die of old age. We still have a lot of work to do here, but that is a wrap for today, everyone. The engine bay is looking a lot cleaner. We'll show it to you in the next episode when it's all dried off and uh, looking even better. And then we're gonna start to dig deeper by turning this thing back into a proper twin turbo runner and driver. So stay tuned for all of that. Thank you very much for watching everyone. And thank you Turn 14 Distribution for your support. As luck would have it, the front turbo you can see is off on the setup there and that is because something has gone through the impeller. It is chewed up in there and I, I'm pretty sure it would still work, but